This is OGM's weekly check-in call for December, Thursday, December 16th, 2021. We are getting close, very close to the end of 2021, which alongside 2020 will be years that are remembered in infamy, kind of. Um, and it's nice to see you all. Hey, John. Hey, Doug. Hey, Gil. Hello, Jerry. Um, excellent. I'm really here. There you are. Poof. And there you're gone. That's amazing. <laughs> How you can appear and vanish. It's crazy. Um, it's paraphysics. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or pataphysics, if anybody knows Howard <laughs> Rheingold. Or pataphysics. Yeah. Exactly. Let's uh, see if I've got anything on pataphysics. Yeah, pataphysics has an entry. Uh, I know Howard Rheingold. Yeah. Yeah. Hello there. What's the context? So uh, we were talking about the strange physics of Gill's ability to appear and vanish in a moment. And, <laughs> and that led us to pataphysics, which... Uh, which we need to find, Jerry, please. Uh, pardon, Pat, I've just put a link in the in the chat uh, there. It has a Wikipedia page, of course. Okay. Of course. Of course. Uh, let me just uh, see. What's today? Uh, OGM. I don't for some reason. You what? I don't have a Wikipedia page. Oh, well, you should for good. For God's sake. Should I did. They took it down. They thought it was self-promotion or something like that. They thought they thought I wrote it. Um, or it, it might also be the notability criterion, which you would you should you should hop right over. Um, that's weird. So that means other people besides you should should work on it. We should, uh, huh? Do you have a link to the dead page? Do you mind putting that in the chat? We can see if anybody in OGM wants to go like. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it. Do CPR on it. Oh, <clears throat> um, cool. And. Um, so I so um, I get poem of the day uh, from poetry.com and today's this morning's poem was by Bell Hooks who just passed away um, so. and I'm inclined to actually read it to us because it's beautiful and a little sad so I'm not sure I'm gonna make it through properly um, but let me just uh, offer a link and then I'll I'll read the poem. Um, it's called Appalachian. Elegy sections one through six, and uh, I will take guidance on whether you like you all like Appalachian or Appalachian or some other pronunciation. Um, but I'm good with Appalachian. Uh, so let me read this uh, as a way of starting today's call. <clears throat> Appalachian elegy sections one through six by Bell Hooks. And if all of you could mute, that would be helpful. Hear them cry. The long dead, the long gone, speak to us from beyond the grave. Guide us that we may learn all the ways to hold tender this land. Hard clay direct, rock upon rock, charred earth. In time, strong green growth will rise here. Trees back to life, native flowers pushing the fragrance of hope, the promise of resurrection. Such then is beauty surrendered against all hope. You are here again, turning slowly, nature as chameleon, all life change and changing again, awakening hearts, steady moving from unnamed loss into fierce, deep grief that can bear all burdens, even the long passage into a shadowy dark where no light enters. Night moves through the thick dark, a heavy silence outside near the front window, a black bear stamps down plants, pushing back brush, fleeing man-made confinement, roaming unfettered, confident. Any place can become home, strutting down a steep hill as though freedom is all in the now. No past, no present. Earthworks, thick brown mud, clinging, pulling a body down, a herd wounded earth cry, bequeathed to me the, ho the hope, ancestral rites to turn the ground over, to shovel and sift until history, rewritten, resurrected, returns to its rightful owners, a past to claim, yet another stone lifted to throw against the enemy, making way for new endings, random seeds spreading over the hillside, wild roses, 
overcome by fierce wind and hard rain, unleashed furies here in this touched wood, a dirge, a lamentation for earth to live again, earth that is all at once a grave, a resting place, a bed of new beginnings, avalanche of splendor. Small horses ride me, carry my dreams of prairies and frontiers where once the first people roamed, claimed union with the earth, no right to own or possess, no sense of territory, all boundaries placed by unseen ones. Here I will give you thunder, shatter your hearts with rain, let snow soothe you, make your healing water clear, sweet, a sacred spring where the thirsty may drink, animals all. Listen, little sister, angels make their hope here in these hills. Follow me, I will guide you. Careful now, no trespass. I will guide you word for word, mouth for mouth. All the holy ones embracing us, all our kin making home here. Renegade, marooned, lawless fugitives grace these mountains. We have earth to bind us. The covenant between us can never be broken vows to live and let live. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. I find myself wishing I had read more bell hooks and there's no reason to stop now, but um, she was an extraordinary poet and thinker. She was that. Um, a human being. Yeah. I'm, exactly. I'm about halfway through Ain't I Woman. And it's a very tough thing to to take in. It really gives me an amazing appreciation for the strength of the of the African American community and what they suffered, especially the women. And um, you know, she's just she's an amazing feminist writer. I figure I I really need to be reading more black feminist writers to you know get out of my 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 conditioning of being a, a middle-aged white guy. And uh, she opens up some amazing horizons in this book that just, you know, and it's gut-wrenching. And, and it's, it's like, I can't believe, you know, people did this, we, we did this to these people. It's, um, you know, it's, and, and that's what's this whole thing about, we're not gonna teach this stuff in schools because we don't want kids to know. Yeah, and there's tremendous backlash against that right now uh, under, the, under the umbrella of critical race theory, but, but it's really, it's really, I think, pushback against what you just said. Yeah. It's amazing. So I have in my brain uh, a non-white guy canon, which I would love any and all um, contributions to. I think, Ken, you had... Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I put that on... Uh, that was an answer to somebody's query on Facebook, wasn't it? They wanted books about uh, non-white exactly. men and women. Yeah. Exactly. So I'll, I'll put a link to this in the chat as well but I've got a bunch of different books here from different people and probably I should add Ain't I a Woman. Ain't I a Woman's good. And I see you've got Healing Wisdom of Africa. Also, Maladoma Sume passed last week. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that or not. Um, no, I did not know that. Yeah, just uh, I'm on Michael Mead's mailing list and he's got a podcast honoring Maladoma. Um, I think he died on the 9th. Wow. So here's Maladoma Sume and his book the healing wisdom of africa is really cool it's a, what's the what's the what, what, what's the gate for the non-white guy canon what do you mean the gate what 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 earns something a place on that um yeah. it's books mostly written by non-white guys sometimes written by white guys books yeah. that offer access and perspective on uh, yeah. other people's lives and gotcha. the pain they go through and um, often what's caused by the white guys. Non-white non and or non-guy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and again, my favorite saying about this general topic is the privilege of privilege is not noticing the privilege. Right. Um, by which I think the implication is that uh, here's the privilege of privilege is not noticing the privilege. And the implication of that is that white guys um, ought to spend uh, a lot of time trying to immerse themselves in other people's shoes uh, and live those perspectives in some way. So any and all guidance on this, opinions on this, disagreement with this, completely welcome. 
I'll stop the screen share now. There's um, also um, when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression, which sort of is a nice summation of um, the pushback we're seeing. Um, totally, and 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 in sympathy with um, people who feel like like white replacement or whatever else, um, and also just not the white replacement people, but other white folk uh, who were protesting right now. I think to them, in particular to white men, a lot of progress, and I'll put that in air quotes, feels like loss. It just feels like loss. Loss of status, loss of privilege, loss of attention, loss of possibilities in their future, loss of, loss of, loss of. And they, they're not seeing this often as gain. Um, as gain for society, as gain for possibilities, as gain, like, like everything feels like loss. And I'm reminded here that my mom toward the end of her life saw everything as loss. At one point, her, she couldn't drive her car. And at one point we had to downsize her. And at one point, you know, and, and, every, and every, every, at one point she was not allowed to smoke anymore because they wouldn't replace her hip unless she'd stop smoking for 30 days before surgery. Because it turns out that smoking uh, t t gives you a 5% higher chance of complications after surgery and et cetera. But, but everything felt like loss, right? And I think that there's a, an opportunity here to, to change those scripts in some way that, that's interesting and maybe pretty deep. Um, so this is, this is not the topic I had broadcast uh, yesterday for us to talk about, but it's a, I think it's an Im important topic for us to touch. Stuart, did you want to jump in? <laughs> How'd you guess? <laughs> I can just, I, I'm, a, I'm a reasonably good face reader. I'm a, and you had that, I'm about to say something kind of look. I mean, it was, it was kind of there, so. Jump in. Thank you. Well, I, I, you know, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the conversation and what the specific prompt was, but I can, I can fill in the blanks. I think um, when you start to look at 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 this whole milieu with a broader perspective and think of it in terms of 1619 and think about slavery and how people have been oppressed. Um, and you know, and and we're still living in some ways in a in a de facto segregated world. Though we've made uh, lots of um, lots of movement forward, there's still a lot of people that are just holding on to that paradigm. One of the things that pops up for me immediately is um, I I couldn't I couldn't grasp why and how 75 million people <laughs> voted for Donald Trump. I just couldn't. I just couldn't grasp it. And then when I read the book *Cast*, which equates, you know, the U.S. culture with with Germany and um, 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 and India, um, I got it. It was all about racism, and it's about um, people's need, especially white men's need, to be better than someone else as as a way of um, enhancing their own status. Um, and so there it, there it is. Um, and m my kind of inquiry is always, so how is it that we can get individuals to embrace and change their thinking? Otherwise, we're going to have more and more, you know, attacks on the U.S. Capitol because of people's um, level of general, you know, frustration and not being able to accept that there are a lot of people of different races that are um, just as smart, just as accomplished, just as um, concerned about the same things that uh, white people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't want to distract from what you just said because it's really important. But I will, I will add that I don't, I don't know that all, everybody voted for not everybody, but I don't know that the majority of people voting for Trump were voting because racism, although it's gigantic. I just posted a list to a. I just posted a link to a playlist of videos that I posted about dealing with Trump. And one of the things, one of the things I believe there is that many people voted for Trump because they thought our system is screwed, the system is rigged, and we need to push a fire ship into the system. And if and if that fire ship and his family and everybody else make a lot of money breaking the system, that's okay with us because the system is so far gone that I don't see a good future for my kids or whatever else. And 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 there's you know, racism is sort of uh, next to that and overlappy a lot, but I think that was just a huge, huge force. And in fact, some people who were, would have voted for Bernie 
went over and voted for Trump because Bernie was like, the system is broken. We need to really sort of fix it. And that, that's just my, my own belief system there. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, just to finish that thought, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that. But when I try to do just some uh, um, calculation, some gross calculation, X number of people who were, you know, one issue voters who voted because of abortion right. or who voted because of somebody, the, the reasons that you mentioned, and you start to chunk that in, there was still a, a big number, I think, that were just racists. I, I agree. And, and, Trump's election was like running a magnet over the beach and like like racists just stood up and said, here I am. And it's like quite amazing. And, and one of the weird silver linings of the Trump administration and Trump's presence in life is that he has caused uh, America's subtle, often <clears throat> hidden and ignored racism to just pop right to the surface and go, yeah. hey, mm -hmm. we are right here and look how look how grim this is. Yeah. Um, and and for people of color, they're like, dudes, this has always been this way. You're just not seeing it. So so there's this there's this visibility. It's as if somebody sprayed the invisible thing with purple, you know, fluorescent color and said, hey, look, look, you know, this is this is right over here. Uh, sorry, Gil, for, for thanks for being patient. You're muted. No worries, Jerry. I think what you said is absolutely true. It's kind of disclosing the what's already there and you know, nobody talks about like the crazy uncle in the attic. Uh, but it, uh, to me, it's a real oversimplification to tie Trump to racism purely. Um, and a couple of things on that, and then I want to come back to um, just the, well, the, the, the prior conversation about racism. Um, uh, uh, couple of things to keep in mind. 75 million people voted for Trump, 75, 76 million people voted for Hillary or 77 or whatever it is. And about 150 million people who were eligible to vote didn't vote. And I think it's a really important stat on this election. Um, and it speaks to both the, you know, the Dems failure to turn out another million or two people, which would have swung the election and also the disaffection in the country overall. Um, <clears throat> the Bernie phenomenon is really interesting and really telling because what it wasn't that Bernie voters went over to Trump. It said Bernie and Trump were to some extent speaking to the same constituency. They were both addressing the disaffected working class in the United States in a way that Hillary and others weren't doing. And there was resonance there. Uh, and for Bernie, it was mostly about economics, not, not about race. And people, you know, people who you might call racist would have voted for Bernie had he been, well, they did in the primaries. Right. They may, have, may well have in the general. <clears throat> um, and I, I emphasize that because it, feels to me that it gives a lot more opening than the purely racism interpretation uh, in terms of how you access and build coalitions across differences in perspective. Um, so I think th 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 there's that. The, uh, there was a piece, I'm, I, I mentioned it yesterday in my call, Ken, you heard this, but I, I've got to find where it is, a, a really eloquent piece, maybe in the Atlantic from a, conserv a traditionally conservative Republican uh, not a Rockefeller, like really conservative, conservative Republican who's disaffected with the libertarian crazies in his party, um, but also presented a surprisingly reasonable argument for Trump and Trumpism. Um, now I say surprisingly reasonable. It was not, it wasn't easy for me to dismiss it. I could disagree with it, but I couldn't dismiss it as nuts. It was like, oh, here's an interesting point of view. I, you know, that let's look at that. So there's, for me, that gives a lot more, um, fluidity in the American political landscape. So I wanna say that back to the, 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 the pervasive, ugly underbelly. I'm, I'm, I'm continually shocked. I mean, I, I didn't grow up ignorant of this stuff. When I was you know, civil rights kid in the sixties and et cetera, I'm continually shocked at how deep and how ugly this is in this country. Just un, you know, even though I know I'm just like blown away again and again at that. Um, and, um, you know, people talk about the possibility of civil war. Well, it's been civil war since the civil war in black communities, including large scale massacres and the rest of it. Um, but, you know, the thing about, about white men needing somebody to look down to, that may be innate and that may also be generated. There was, um, in, the, in, the, in the middle 18th century, there was a thing called Bacon's Rebellion in the United States, which was a white and black working class rebellion against landowners. It's not much talked about. Um, but one of the responses from that was, was a cranking up of racism as an intentional strategy to keep that unity from ever happening again. 
So there may be a latent human tendency to disparage the other, but there's also a way that it becomes useful to protect privilege uh, in very active ways. Um, the, um, I wanted to add that, what was the other thing? So, you know, Stuart, to, to what you said, I've, I've, I've been feeling a lot lately, I've been thinking a lot about what, I, what I'm calling the, the battle for the story of the world. For me, is one way of making sense out of what we're in right now. And I grew up, you know, in, I was a kid in the 1950s in America in white communities on the East Coast. My only contact with Black people was a young woman who was, who was, who was like a, not maid, but uh, what we would now call au pair, I guess. Uh, so, you know, it's a very insulated world, but there was a story in that world. And the story now is very different. And, you know, people... It, Stuart, you said people don't change. People do change. The gen, you know, the attitudes in this country around race are to a large degree very different than when I grew up. The degree of contact, the degree of mixing. Uh, you know, my nieces do just do not see skin color in the way that I do. It's just it's just not there in their perception. It's not they make different interpretations about it. They don't even notice it in the way that I still notice it, but have different interpretations than my dad did, who had different interpretations than the people he worked with. Um, some of what I think is happening is, is, is people trying to not like in the story we're in and wanting to flee back to the other one. Uh, and normally narrative shift in a multi-dimensional cultural process. And here we're having people trying to enforce the narrative shift by saying, you cannot teach our kids these things that actually happened. You know, denial of history takes us back to 1984 and all that. And just a side note there, Rebecca Solnit's little book, Orwell's Roses, um, uh, added to your reading list. It's very Orwell's, Orwell's Roses? Orwell's Roses. Solnit is just a remarkable, remarkable. I have not, I did not know she had this book out. There's, it just came out. Uh, there's a dialogue with her and Heather Cox Richardson, the historian. Mm -hmm. Also, if people don't know her, you want to check her out. She does pretty much a daily Deep subscribe to her, yeah, oh, subscribe to her newsletter. Oh, so they have a dialogue. And one of the things that Sonet says is that um, it's called it's called Orwell's Roses because for all of his focus on, um, you know, the trial, the, the travails of the working class and the darkness of the, you know, the impending future that we now seem to be moving into, he was an avid gardener. And he found great joy uh, in gardening and roses and so forth. And he would be attacked by people on the left who said that flowers are bourgeois. <clears throat> that's and amazing just well in, amazing but not surprising about the left at that time um and uh anyhow so uh, just a, a a vote for the multi-dimensionality of human beingness yeah yeah so, thanks Gil. Uh, i'm taking too long on the platform i apologize that's all right it was I love a what question for philip um how how do you read the um, views and, and learnings by robert reich uh, I love him. Reich is another prolific uh, treasure. He's writing long pieces almost every day. Uh, I, I'm a short answer. I largely subscribe to his perspective. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Before, before and, and I go for to- those, and For those who haven't seen it, have a look. He's writing. He also, he, he's become a multimedia artist. He does short films. He does cartoons. He's working in many different dimensions in ways that are very accessible and I think deserves a wider audience. Um, yeah, and he's, he's very accessible and also um, loves to pun about how short he is. Yes. Uh, he, he like, so uh, how he, does the map look like, Jerry, if you put up Robert Reich? Uh, I will show you right now, in fact. I just turned to Robert Reich. As he's a multi-artist. <laughs> and there we are. And I don't have him under multi-artist, but I have him under the Clinton administration, the Carter administration, teaching at Brandeis, an economist. Uh, American right, yeah. co-founded co the American Prospect, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, here are some of his books and some articles by and about him. Uh, but including, including, for example, uh, videos like this, the system who rigged it, how we fix it, right? Uh, and he's in which he says the real conflict is between democracy and oligarchy. And I don't remember having put this in my brain, but there it is. Um, the brain has a mind of its own. Doesn't it? Which I like. I'm I'm a big fan of, of this thing running off on its own. Um, and before turning to Eric and Klaus, I wanted to add a link to. Um, so 
we're doing Weaving the World. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bumpy and slow in standing it up, but uh, we've, I've got four interviews recorded that'll turn into the four, first four episodes of Weaving the World, a podcast to try to weave the world. Uh, and I'm looking to book now some mapping sessions, some, some composting sessions we're calling in about these calls. Uh, but one of these first four episodes will be uh, this call that I did with Daryl Davis, uh, who is one of my heroes. And uh, what I've just uh, put in the chat is a link to the unlisted video because this is the raw video. Um, and I intend to put an intro and an outro on it and make it look and smell like a podcast. Uh, but it's it's wonderful, and he has he's the the jazz musician who has a garage full of Ku Klux Klan robes, uh, and the conversation was lovely. Uh, learned stuff about his background that was quite amazing, and on from there. So uh, let's go, Eric and Klaus. Yeah, hi. So for people who came in, um, we've been talking about a different topic, and I'm just going to give my two cents. So I was surfing Jerry's brain yesterday and I found the TED Talks by April and Kate Rayworth. So I watched those two. Um, April was giving her introduction to Flux and to her background. And I think that her perspective is very useful if you're looking to help people um, deal with the changes that we're facing uh, or different attitudes that we're trying to promote. So Kate Rayworth is donut economics, and it uh, yeah I'm, I'm not getting it all yet, but it seems to make sense. Uh, there's other economic models. I got that book Thrive, so I was flipping through it. Uh, various authors commenting. It's just an interest of mine. Now um, I grew up in Canarsie in Brooklyn, and before I was born in 1970, there were issues of uh, busing, interracial in the schools. So there's a book out there uh, uh, named Canarsie. Um, now, when I was around 30, I decided on my own just to sponsor a child in Africa through Save the Children. And that experience opened me up a totally different way of thinking. Um, a little girl, uh, eight years old, lived in poverty uh, in Malawi, where um, they have overcrowded schools. And uh, so I mean, my money was pooled with other donors to help the communities that they were serving and their goal is to help them become independent. Um, but uh, just opening up my a new perspective to their traditions, um, how they go through some kind of initiation ceremony at a certain age and change their name. And uh, this girl had lost her mother, but she had like four siblings. So... Very interesting perspective. Um, and let's see. I just made notes as I was thinking here. You bet. You yeah. Bet. I do have some notes when we get to the topic we want to discuss. But, which, uh, which we're going to head back to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll stop for now. Thanks, Eric. Um, Mr. Mager. Yeah, I wanted to bring in some perspective from my you know, somewhat different background here. I mean, I grew up in Germany. I was born in 1949. And my generation is like deeply traumatized to have learned what happened, you know, and because after the war, <clears throat> the uh, Allies uh, forced the Germans to, to broadcast on TV these incredible footages that, uh, that the Nazis had filmed. So I was unsupervised as a little boy because my parents had a restaurant. So I would never only like one TV channel. I think it played on two, right, black and white. And so I watched people lined up and uh, moved to have to undress and then go towards a big hole and got shot in the head and fell into this mass grave. And I mean, just incredible, incredible images. That, uh, that are really, I mean, searing yourself, uh, se searing themselves into your mind. And then you, you understand how these experiments were done, right, on inferior races. So the Jews were an inferior race, the gypsies, you know, the, the, these marginalized communities, and, and, and the justification to, to do these incredible things came out of that. 
But then when I retired back into the US, come from working overseas, we did, my wife and I went, uh, bought an RV and we traveled across the United States. And I want, wanted to see all the historic uh, 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 impressions, you know, how did the United States really get formed? So you go to the Alamo and you know, as a European, you think this is a historic site, I mean, give me a break, <laughs> what is this here? But, but then you read the story on why this is you know, such a historic site. And then you understand, you know, that Napoleon uh, appointed his brother to be the king of Spain and told him to get the hell out of Texas. So the Spaniards withdrew from Texas. And so you, you, you see the deep penetration of Europeans, you know, into this American life. So this mess started with the Europeans immigrating into this country and, and unimpeded, you know, where, where uh, plundering and raping and, you know, you go down, you travel to South America and you see the story of how the Spaniards came into Peru, you know, and in, in, in dealing with the Incas. And so, I mean, unbelievable cruelties, right? The, the unspeakable atrocities they were conducting there. But then, then I, I, you know, uh, traveled to China and started working in China. And I remember I was in Inner Mongolia negotiating a, a corporate alliance agreement with a dairy company there. And the contact that I had, the, the director of uh, marketing, you know, was my working partner. And, and we are you know, in Mongolia, in Inner Mongolia. So I asked his assistant when they're telling us their life stories. And I asked, uh, so, so Mr. So and so, so he is Mongolian because he was born and raised in this Mongolian city. And she just lost it. He's Han Chinese, right? I mean, the idea that, that someone mm -hmm. in this position could be Mongolian was just, it was an insult, right? I mean, I had inadvertently insulted them by, by uh, uh, asking whether he is Mongolian instead of Han Chinese. So you look at the Chinese, they're deeply racist people incredibly, you know, that, 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 that superiority idea of the Han Chinese against the Uyghurs, against the Tibetans, against the Mongolians, against that, that is completely race-based. Yeah? Then you go to Turkey and you see how they're treating the Kurds. Right? So this, this idea of racial superior, superiority, I think, originates with tribal uh, uh, memories, right? Coming through historic... Uh, uh, um, events where you no know, tribes would uh, seek uh, advantage over other tribes and and so on. So it's a deep seated issue that is embedded you know, in our culture, uh, in in our in in our species. I would argue. Uh, I mean, I had the weirdest experiences. But, I mean, I, I felt like a, you know, like a king going to China. I was one guy. I hired one thousand eight hundred people opening up Hong Kong Disneyland, I was the only Westerner, right? I mean, my chef wow. was, was Swiss. The two of us were the only expats. The rest were all Chinese. And, and, you, you, and then when I traveled into China and around the area, you never knew um, whether you were being greeted because you worked for Disney or whether there's this white guy, you know, he's German, this American training. Uh, uh, so, so you, you know, it, it was, it was, a very strange you know, experience to have this sense of uh, being valued for something other than your work, just because you're a white guy with this kind of background. So it's a universal condition, you know, and, and in America, uh, we better shut up criticizing the Chinese <laughs> or anybody really, <laughs> because my God, I mean, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have issues here that, we, that we're unwilling to solve. I'm just, I'm just saying this is, this is, I mean, you, you, you go to Myanmar, you know, and then they're eradicating their Muslim uh, population. You know? So there is this tribal instinct that we, that we haven't been able to get behind us yet. That's sort of my life experience. Yeah, um, Stuart. Yeah, just quickly, a couple of couple of thoughts. Um, I was out for a walk before I got on the call this morning, and I saw a flock of birds, <laughs> and it triggered thinking about why birds of similar ilk fly together in formation. And so it's it's just an example of how programmed we are to be attracted to and congregate with like people. 
That being said, as humans with some degree of consciousness and awareness and, and capacity for reflection, I think that the growth step, the learning step is to realize the knee jerk reaction we have about being attracted to like kind and to step <laughs> beyond that. Um, I, was, I was designing a webinar um, this week uh, and, and working with a colleague uh, on the design of it. And then we thought about two other people to invite in to be on this panel. And, uh, and I, I, I looked at that and I said, oh, cause the organ, it's for the American Bar Association who like to have diversity in their panels. Uh, it's almost a requirement. And, uh, and I said to these, about these two new people, oh, but they're both white. Yeah, they're, they're you know, one of each gender, but they're both white. Uh, and then I realized, oh, the colleague that I'm working with, Phyllis, happens to be black. A and I just said to myself, my goodness, am I making progress here? Did I not see <laughs> her as a black person? Did I just see her as a, as a competent individual? And what I wanted to say about Robert Reich, I think one of the things that he kind of is, is so aware of is that at, at, to some degree, some great degree, it's a class and income disparity, not so much a, um, a, a racial disparity. Thanks. Um, thank you all for this conversation. We uh, were 36 minutes into the hour and weren't intending to go in this direction, but bell hooks died and here we are. Um, so thank you for that. And I would love to head toward uh, the topic Eric had, had suggested. And a couple of us on the call here were on the Friday lunch at the archive uh, where I was the guest. And I was just hoping that maybe uh, uh, we could sort of check in together to, to, to put the issue on the table because um, part of this question, most of you are probably familiar with the Internet Archive. It is uh, one of the modern marvels of the world as far as I can tell um, in my own pantheon, uh, Brewster Kale, its founder, will be seen as the Ben Franklin of our era, because uh, Ben Franklin started public libraries and a bunch of other kind of stuff. And Brewster has that same exact instinct and has created like massive interesting things and has performed kind of business jujitsu to make these things stay alive and, and, and get lift and all that. And it's just amazing to me. Uh, so the question at hand, I'll just start it uh, and then pass it to you, Eric, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, the question is, uh, what sorts of synergies or connections could there be between the archives work and OGM? And, um, and that's part of what I talked about. I, I sort of presented both my own work in 24 years of, of feed, feeding this brain thing, but then the birth of OGM and the goals of OGM and the dynamics of OGM. And we kind of left at the end of the conversation this open question about how might we collaborate? What could we do together? Um, so I'll just pause there and pass it to Eric. Hey, thank you. So um, this morning I thought of uh, four questions I'm going to paste in the chat to help uh, people who need, need some structure. Um, so I just pasted them in now. Um, and I'm going to give a little intro. So for me, um, I first learned that the Internet Archive was more than the Wayback Machine from Jason Scott. Um, he did a presentation for Kansas Fest, which is an annual event for the Apple II community. And uh, then I explored the archive. A lot of Apple software is on there, and you could run it within the browser. And then there's a lot of music. And um, then I used it to find some research materials when I was uh, looking at uh, Ted Nelson's work and Jeff Raskin's work. And then I found Open Library, and I read a book online. So there was a project through Kansas Fest to have Ted Nelson's junk mail scanned. So what was amazing is that Ted collected material where you send in a reader service card and they send you a lot of stuff from a company. And he did this for about 30 years and you have some amazing print material. So there was a project proposed by Kay Savitz. And what he did was he organized volunteers 
to scan materials. And then I contributed to that. To, so I donated and it was completely funded by donations. And now it's up there. It's a Ted Nelson junk mail collection. So when it came down to looking how I wanted to use the archive, <clears throat> so I contacted Jason Scott and he told me some specific things like uh, for documents, he wants a zip file of TIFF files and scan it at 600 DPI. And then uh, for software, there are certain tags you could add so that it runs in an online emulator. And then I sent them a box of my old floppy disks. And um, then he did a Twitch stream showing how he's archiving all those disks. And then he returned the, them to me. And then I found that I could use the archive for my podcasts. I had MP3s of an internet radio show that I did in 2009. And then there's another person who I helped with a radio show and that person's passed away, but his stuff is on the archive. And I found that I could help a nonprofit uh, doing weekly recordings to archive them. And since I'm using some storage and bandwidth, I donate to the archive every year. And uh, let's see. And then I uh, found like uh, uh, some CD-ROMs I had, which had podcasts from 2004. So I sent them to, so Jason set up an SFTP account for me and I was able to upload them. And then he did a deduplication and published the collection. And, uh, and then Jason does these Twitch streams. So I was able to ask some questions like about archiving VHS tapes. So, what I'm really desiring are a few things. So like some utilities, so people can check if an item they own is in the archive. I know that there's um, an ISBN lookup for open library. Um, so you could see if any books that you have are in the library and maybe just some improvements in the user experience to help people find answers to their questions about the archive and maybe some initiative to help people who are downsizing to figure out what that they want to what they can donate to the archive and where they could drop it off i don't know if there's any initiatives to have some local drop off points for media that can get to the archive and um, yeah and then, then maybe there's some creative projects to build awareness of what's available in the archive so for in terms of OGM, uh, some things I see possible are archiving audio video materials that would be outside of any commercial platform like YouTube or Facebook. Um, sharing of work currently being done and planned for the future with the archive people and just some informal connections uh, with, with people who share common interests, maybe some special interest groups with the people we talk to. And I'll leave it there. Um, thanks, thanks, Eric. Uh, anybody, thoughts, comments? Uh, Mark, I want to pass you the floor in a second to, to also offer your perspective, but I, I want to wait for a second. Any thoughts or comments on what Eric just said? Um, here, if, here. Not, uh, if not, uh, yeah, good. Uh, if not, go ahead, Mark, let's, uh, let's build on that. Um, boy, uh, Eric, that was a lot of things, and uh, I uh, usually write things down. Uh, I, I did not at the moment. Um, uh, starting backwards, um, boy, um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for your donation. Um, uh, we have raised uh, $9 million this donation season. Um, thank you. Thanks for your support, um, and uh, and our donation season isn't over. We've uh, close to reached our goal for the, um, and uh, we have a great team who works on outreach and you know connecting with libraries, connecting with people, connecting um, uh, with. Uh, the world of people who want to make the internet a safe place to live, a non-creepy place, a place that we deserve 
to have as a resource for humanity. Um, that's why I'm there. Um, that's why, you know, a lot of us are, are there. Um, and uh, it's not a perfect place by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I won't, I won't talk that much about how my job is really stressful, which is uh, UX, user experience. Um, how do we support people who are blind, who have print disabilities, who are um, different in terms of their cognition, autistic people, and their response to different colors and different ways of having energy or high energy or low energy. Um, and basically, I, I fix bugs. And I'm really good at finding problems, and I find more problems than I can fix. Um, so uh, enough about me. Um, Eric, uh, we have uh, boxes sent to us every day that arrive by FedEx and UPS um, that uh, uh, contain books for, for us to scan. Um, I'm talking personally with a number of of different people in their 80s who basically want to um, put their life's work up on the archive. And um, the best advice that I get when I talk to people above me is uh, tell them to use the upload button. The upload button is always there on the, on the home page and every other page. You're, uh, I may not agree with that as the, uh, as the way that, and as a you know programmer and somebody who, uh, it's it's hard, it's difficult to use. People naturally don't understand what metadata is. Um, boy, somebody could really rewrite the um, the upload instructions and help people with the metadata. And we've talked about this as the people who are responsible for designing and implementing that feature. I've been there three years. We've talked about it for three years. It hasn't really gotten that much better. Yeah. Um, please, uh, John Kelly has his hand up. Uh, I don't know if he has a question for me or you know a, a comment, but I wanted to note, Eric, that I didn't get to everything you said. You said a lot, and I'm going to listen to the recording and you know write it down. And and hey, I'm informal. I'm not the formal um uh internet archive person <laughs> that uh jerry knows would be uh mark graham um certainly uh brewster kale um and there are other folks who are are happy to to listen over to john um before passing the mic to john i just wanted to put two things in the conversation one is that a standard standard fair for the friday lunches at the archive and it happened uh this last friday was um a fellow who was standing in a physical warehouse full of books uh, like just glowing because there were shrink wrap pallets of books behind him that didn't weren't of, of books that are not in the archive yet that wow. have been donated to the archive the so, are so, so what you see a lot sorry Gil, i'm going to mute you for a second um so so you see collections coming in physical collections and then at the archive sort of around the corner in the next next building there are scanners and people scanning and there's the automation and there's like microfilm scanning and all kinds of really sophisticated stuff to try to make faithful copies of those works when they come in and then off site and i remember passing pretty sure it was the archive, archive thing uh, my mom used to live in point richmond across the bay from san francisco and I, occasionally i would drive by a warehouse that was basically where a lot of books that had been scanned were being sent and stored. So there's like all these interesting sequences, never mind the copies of the archive that are mirrored around the world and all that. So that, that's one thing I want to say. And then the second thing was, I'm hoping to tune this conversation a little bit toward, might there be an OGME layer that plays in or around the archive? Might we be able to help the archive not just be the stored record of stuff in, in different places, but also uh, opinions, conversations, uh, logics, uh, other sorts of things that that are sort of the the the, the funny little layer of, of fungus that we're we're really interested in here, and that might be a good moment to pass to John because uh, John and Doug and uh, Vivek Kaltising have been working on something that is an idea of attaching some things to uh, news items, sort of kind of 
not metadata, but links to going deeper for news items, a, a way of contextualizing news items. And I might have misrepresented that, but with that, uh, over to you in the booth, John. Okay, thank you, Jerry. And uh, thank you, Mark and Eric, and for all those ideas. I'm a little bit torn because I mean, the, the, the Internet Archive is doing all these things. And just like Jerry said, you know, you see something like that going on. You say, wow, this is valuable. I'm really glad this is happening. If I had lots of money, I would donate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, um, there's this other thing that says, well, what's the particular nuance that might be missing? And what's the particular skill set, you know, that OGM could bring to an effort and what else is going on in the world of sense making that we ought to pay attention to. So there are a couple of different sources here. There was the uh, Aspen Institute has an RFP out due January 10 for uh, ways to combat misinformation, disinformation. Lots of work going on there. Good work, bad work, crazy work. It's all, it's huge, it's going all the time. Um, Doug had earlier, in a different context, come up with this idea that one of the problems with headline news or 24-hour news is you get this, blah, 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 you know, this is what's happening, and then you don't, you don't get the context. And even if you are a, a, the kind of thinker who would, always, who would ask just instinctively, what's the context of that? What else is going on there? You would not, not, not necessarily be able to bring it up. So what if someone did some of that uh, work for you in a non-presumptuous way? What if someone said, well, here's the article that came out today, but here's the article that came out last week about the same topic. And here's the article that came out perhaps sometime in the last, you know, what week to months ish range. And here's the longer piece. Here's the, the thought piece that appeared in the Atlantic, the New Yorker or somewhere. And here's a book about this topic or that would inform this topic. And maybe here's a movie that you, you'd wanna look at. And all that is this kind of sense-making stack that backs up the, the chosen current today news article. So that's the idea in a, in a nutshell. And I think there's a couple of really interesting spins from this idea. One, it would be worth doing, it would be worth having, I don't, Personally, I don't think Aspen Institute's gonna, gonna go for this because it's not glitzy, it's not techy, it's not, doesn't use software. Because as, as conceived, it's kind of like a couple of humans like us divide up the work. We take an article, we say, okay, what's the one from last week? What's the one, you know, what, how about a book? You know, we have a little discussion, blah, blah, blah. And then bing, we publish the stack for the current article. Yeah, okay, that's a possibility. Uh, do, do we brand that as an OGM thing? Maybe if it's helpful. Um, you know, I was playing with the idea this morning. I was getting this kind of idea that you know how they have these contests, and you know they have the the long list and the short list for the for the book prize and all these kind of things. And uh, you 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 could even get a you know I mean it's not it's, we're never going to get to the level of the Nobel, but people there's a whole trail of speculation about what's going to get into the, you know, what's going to be linked, who's going to win the Nobel in physics, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a big question, a lot of people are interested in. A minor, minor, like sports trivia question is, what's going to be in the stack uh, behind this article that says Facebook did X? And just by the way, uh, there's a, uh, something on Clubhouse called Tech News Around the World, and Tyler uh, Cohen, I think his name is, um, does exactly this kind of speculation. He, he, here's the news today. Here's what the guy who wrote that article didn't pay attention to. Here's why that's not good journalism. I mean, that's is a big part of tech news around the world. Um, so these are all just, these are ideas and resources. Uh, let's, let's consider them fertilizer and generate new ideas uh, from them and see where it goes. Um, thanks, John. And I'm just realizing that Jamie Joyce would be lovely to have in this conversation with the uh, uh, Library of Society and, and things like that. Um, Doug, I was did you... about to say the same thing. 
Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, Doug, did you want to jump in and, and layer on top of that? Unmute myself here. Well done. Well, like any idea, it's got lots of details that are important, but the key is that you come to a screen and it's got columns and rows. Each column starts with a, a hot news item from the day. Uh, and they're uh, probably a maximum of six. So it takes some discretion. In the column on the spreadsheet underneath the, the, the topic is, uh, uh, well, the topic of course is a link to an article. So there's no problem with copyright because it's just a link. Doug? Um, yeah. So uh, John shared the spreadsheet with me. I've got it open in a tab. May I, do I have permission to share it into the conversation? Sure, yeah. Good, so while you're talking, everybody can see what you're talking about. Go ahead. Okay, so the, the key thing is the column. Starting with today's story, then in the cell underneath is a link to yesterday's story about the same topic. Then uh, under that, a link to uh, maybe the very first story about this topic. Underneath that is a link to a magazine article which spells out in more detail what the issues are. Notice the intent here is not to be uh, complete. Uh, it's to be suggestive with things that anybody who's concerned with this uh, uh, top story uh, would want to know. And in particular, it was designed to uh, be a resource to congressional researchers and to journalists. Uh, when a story gets old, it moves over to the far left as an archive, which is chronological of all the things that have ever been in a story. Uh, so anyway, I think you probably get the idea. It's, it's very simple. Uh, we did an experiment with trying to fill out a column, and it takes about 20 minutes uh, from the top article uh, down to a relevant book. Um, so that's the idea. Um, thanks, Doug. Anyone with thought, would you like this, use this? Should somebody do this? Would this be helpful? Anyone? Yeah. Um, is the top story of the day the news item itself, or is the top story covering that news item in the New York Times or the Washington Post or Reuters, or how do you handle multiple interpretations like that? Well, the first thing is not to uh, give the illusion that you're being comprehensive. You're being suggestive. People who are concerned about this topic uh, could yep. learn from this column. And that the top is the name of the story and a link to it. That's it. So is that link, uh, who chooses where that link goes? Because that link could go to Newsmax, it could go to the New York Times, it could go to Reuters. Like, yeah, like, just, and that, and that matters a huge amount in whether somebody's even going to look at it. Uh, it does, and there's no hint here that this is comprehensive or that there's an algorithm that's making a, a, fine, a numerical judgment about it. Uh -huh. It's yeah, sure, human being making, saying, this is good you're stuff. Making, you're making an editorial judgment, so are you going to always go to the Times, or are you going to rotate it, or how, what, how, how are you deciding that? I'd vote for rotation, but let's have other oh, ideas. Yeah, it'd be rotation, but not mechanical. It would be what seems to be the, the best story about this. Um, so, so there's nothing stopping someone from inventing a news service and recruiting 12 people to test this out for a week and you know, turning something out. Like, like news services abound. I have a huge collection of different kinds of news services that are in my brain. Uh, and this is a, a relatively simple experiment to try manually, just to do the, you know, a sneaker net basically style, uh, give it give it a whirl, um, uh, and then I, th I think the point of view the point of view question like uh, who which articles are cited and who would read what is really interesting. But then the, there's another piece here which is like I'm getting this feeling that we're kind of navigating up down around. And for example, a long 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 time ago in the early days of the inner tubes. I had this wish list item uh, for press releases. I was like, why are press releases so freaking stupid? Why don't press releases have a link to the, 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 the product being talked about and a link to previous press releases and a link to the history of that product? And like, why aren't press releases actually linky and useful, right? And they're not, they're still to this day, I get press releases that are plain text and it's just like, seriously people, are you trying not to be helpful on purpose? Right, because I, I like you delete them. You just they're they're not interesting or useful. Now, 
good writers make linky text and give you context and why I wrote this paragraph and so forth. So here we're, we're sort of talking about context around an article. And it seems to me like one of the links here is let's link up to the timeline. And it's almost, I'm getting this feeling of a paratrooper sort of linking up to the wire before you jump out of the plane, jump out of, out of the airplane. But, but the timeline is what happened yesterday and, and all of that. But it's just kind of a timeline of a mess of articles. And, and you may want to, you, then you need to pick what was the previous article. Do you mean the previous article by this writer, the previous article in this publication about this topic? Like previous article is, is, is equally as controversial as what you started with. Then there's this whole idea about take me to the broader focus on the context of this topic, right? Uh, and, and then you might curate a couple of really great, I think that's what you mean by magazine articles, which is like, hey, here's somebody who actually said, this is the bigger picture folks, but the bigger picture looks different depending on which politics and which perspective you're looking in on it. So maybe comparing those bigger pictures is interesting. I don't know, but, but it seems like one is link up to the timeline of the info torrent. Another is link out to the context of the bigger picture. And those are the, that, to me, those are the gestures, um, is, is uh, timeline, context, and something else. Uh, so that we can, and then maybe a link to, hey, here's a frothy discussion going on right now on, on a Discord server or on a, on a, on a you know, conversational forum someplace about this topic if you'd like to jump in or something like that. And then back to how might OGM sort of fit this and so forth. And then here's a, a mind map that three people have created uh, that might be really useful to you in mapping the issues around this topic or uh, a debate proposition with arguments pro and con or any number of other visualizations of, of that context. So those all those things come to mind around this. Uh, over to you, Michael. Yeah, I was just gonna say we were, we were talking a little bit in the chat. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think Gil, I can't remember if it was, I think Gil was saying, um, you know, he was, he was missing Pete on this call and, and then also Noam, Noam Chomsky. And <clears throat> I think that we all, you know, have this wish that, I, I, I think John and Doug, what, what you were talking about, seems great, it does have the challenge of the necessary editorial staff that needs to be chosen to, to do that thing. And, and who is it? And how do we find that person? And we're waiting for that person or people. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to with a group like OGM and many, many, many more people saying, I don't know, uh, um, you were Jerry in the in the chat mentioning the knitting books. Well, you know, somewhere out there, I mean, I actually know a few of them. There are people who are lifelong knitters and really know their shit and have a historical context. And for them to pick through this like book dump and say, yes, and this, and you know, that's all that person might feel moved to do, but they are contributing to this knowledge sharing, like valuation of all the stuff that's in the internet archive. And, and likewise articles as they come in, yeah, somebody's gonna say, yeah, this, this really relates to this um, Newsmax article or leave a comment that has a perspective that's straight out of Newsmax, but you know, to, to do to add that metadata to as many objects as people are interested in adding it to and then be able to filter based on it is so much richer a resource than I mean the, the, the I love the Internet Archive and the problem I have with it from an interface point of view is it really is digging in the stacks and there's not you know the way to take advantage of the people of like mind or, or mind more advanced than yours on a subject you don't know about who've come before you and poured through those stacks and said, hey, look here, look here. You know, that collective interface is something that could be built very incrementally and folks like us and folks not like us importantly, you know, are, are people who could do that. And so creating the means for that seems critical. And Mark's um, waving, and I'm really curious about. 
Uh, um, Mark, go ahead, jump in. Please, um, the best way you can help the archive is by use cases um, and what you want to do. Um, I had some conversations yesterday about my career. I used to be a consultant. Um, I would, uh, in uh, um, enterprise, enterprises from small companies to large companies, Microsoft and, and AT&T. And my satisfaction in work was solving problems for people. And the, the, the joy I got was people go, wow, you solved this for us. You saved us, you know, 10 hours a day. You, you understood our problem. You created a solution. Boom, it was there. As a product person now, um, in the team where there's millions of people who are using this, I don't talk to people i hate that <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to how to change that what to do um and uh we uh had a meeting about basically how to improve the um uh, uh internet archive where we're basically talking about okay what kind of graph directed random uh or or maybe you know uh, Jack Park brought up the, the notion of topic graphs and, okay, do we wish to basically um, have outside curators come and say, you know what, here's a basic ontology, here's how science connects to literature, and here's, you know, books over here in literature, here's books over here in science, and basically have it crowdsourced, um, and, and that would be beautiful. Um, also, people say, you know, you like um, uh, this book, you might like that book, which is a little more unstructured, you know, structured versus unstructured kind of thing. Anyway, the um, point is, what do you want to do and raise your voice um, and, and contact us? Um, that is what we're looking for in terms of the next you know, how does the Internet Archive become the Internet's library? How, how, how do we reach the uses, uh, I'm sorry, reach the um, great uh, amount of stuff that is um, stored there? And hopefully will be stored there, you know, forever for free if, if we can you know, project that far. Keep it going. Whatever forever is these days. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ken, then Leif and John. Um, so the, the thing that really caught my attention was one of the last things Michael said, and it, it goes to what, you know, when I think about what OGM is and when I came, OGM came out of, uh, inside Jerry's brain and, you know, this whole idea of historical context that, that Jerry's got an amazing ability to provide context for people, um, on things that they're simply ignorant of. And, so, you know, the archive has amazing, vast capacity, as, as Gil just put in the chat, you know, and, and how could we develop an OGM or OGME layer of pointing people towards context? I want to know about this. What can you tell me that I need to have uh, as background so I can make good decisions? And, and to me, I know very little about the technical metadata storage and stuff, but I, I do know about how to create conversations for people of, you know, if you want to know something, you want to talk to some people who've got background on this so you can figure out, you know, where you want to direct your attention. And and so I'm really curious what it would look like for OGM and, and um, you know, at Archive to partner in creating such a thing. What would that actually look like in terms of practical stuff? I love that. Um, one way to try to apply some shorthand to what you said and what's kind of in the air here is how do we help people save time to improve their perspective? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right language or simple enough language, but it's, it's, it's directionally okay. Um, so, so I think that's a really interesting issue here because uh, uh, Michael, you said it's, it's, like, it's like combing the stacks. Absolutely. And the stacks, like one of the things we miss from not visiting libraries and even bookstores anymore is like, you're looking for this kind of book, but eh, look what's over here. 
right? It's the serendipity of what got what got shelved next to what. And and there's actually there's actually an art project, uh, the, the the Society for Misshelved Books or something like that, which intentionally moves books around inside of bookstores and libraries. I, I'll look them up, but but it's a cute it's a cute hack on on you know increasing serendipity in our lives or, or whatever else. Um, but so so how do we get to that perspective? And also I like nothing better than somebody who knows some domain really well, pointing me toward where to look, what to do, and giving me three sentences that shift how I see. And those three sentences can be very contagious and can be very important because they might shift entirely my perception of the field or whatever else. And so who you get them from and what those sentences are matters a great deal because it really, the framing is huge. It, it, just, it just changes the way you see things uh, a lot. And so, so this is an important task not to be handled lightly because of the power of framing and storytelling and all of those things as well. And then I'll, I'll add one last thing, which is I keep coming back to how unique my experience of feeding the brain for 24 years is because I'm not starting from scratch ever on any topic anymore. Every now and then I hit something where, gosh, I've got nothing, but most anything, whether it's the wood wide web or cocktail mixes or uh, the Trobriand Islanders gift rings and all that, exists already as a thing in my brain. And when something new floats along that refers to them, I merely connect it to it. And, and, and so I have, a, I have this rich history that is, that is static and getting better, I think. I don't, I don't detect it getting worse, which is like one of my worries early on was that this thing would just turn into a, a fuzzball that was, that was undistinguishable and unmanageable. And it has not, at least not for me. But, but I'm always co co hooking into a history. So earlier when I said, zooming back out, uh, what is what is the context for the thing you're talking about? That's kind of what I mean. And it's an experience very few people have. We're so used to drowning in the info torrent and not having a good memory that we're like, gosh, here comes another news story. The best I can do is go back a story and up a story and left a story. I think we can do much, much better if we have some shared context. But then the worry is whose shared context do we want to point into, right? And is it the one that I agrees with my point of view so that I reinforce my, my tunnel vision or whatever? Is it a broadening one? Or is that explicitly in the user interface? Hey, here's a, here's a broad context that agrees with your point of view, we think. Here's a broad context, a really nice synthesis that disagrees with your point of view. Would you like to go look at that? That's really interesting to me. Uh, Mark, do you want to jump in before I go to Leif and John? Um, yeah, uh, one uh, slight thing is uh, the folks at... Uh, uh, the embassy, uh, Zarina Agnew and um, uh, other folks had um, a hand signal notion. This I want to make a comment directly on on what you know the other person said, and this is like start a new conversation. Anyway, to comment, Jerry, one of the things in in what I do is basically there's kind of like an independence of mind. And I am not the type of evangelist that says everybody should create their own note-taking system and basically use it to guide an inquiry into the world because that type of being an inquiring person might be the lifestyle that some people are pointing to. But it does seem to me like there's a certain kind of independence or, or somehow that maybe you and I have disconnected ourselves from standard media in some way because we, we basically are weaving this context. And I, I find that to be kind of an ineffable kind of value that I'm trying to figure out how to engage other people in doing the kind of behavior change that leads to what you and I have done. Can you say that once more in a slightly different way? Just pick any other path in, because I think I understand you and I think I agree with you. I just want to re-understand it or try to broaden it because I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> I had difficulty articulating it. Um, the sense that I have spent time, you know, encountering the words of others, certainly, um, you know, listening deeply, which um, is a side effect of, of, of this, but, but also in some kind of way, you know, thinking for myself um, and exploring, you know, huh, I have 
an interest, um, you know, that, you know, Klaus, um, in what Klaus has said, and I'll go follow that, and, and what Jack has said, and what Ken has said, and it's only a beginning for my own weaving. Hmm. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, hmm. But, but it basically encourages a kind of independence of mind that maybe was already there. I really don't know. Um, does anyone else want to, um, and the C's mean what? Comment as opposed to new topic. Like exactly. directly linking to the last thing. Okay, good. Because I'm not, from, this is a new gesture for me on, on this call. I'm not I only learned it from Mark a minute ago. <laughs> comment. Awesome, Mark. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to rephrase, reframe, and or deepen the thing that Mark just put in the conversation before I go to Leif and John? Take a swing at this. Okay, there being there being no takers, let's go to, to Leif. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this, and uh, I'm a newcomer to uh, the conversation, but um, I, I just wanted to make a few remarks here. I really appreciate it, uh, Jerry. Thank you for inviting me. The uh, bridge might be that um, the archive could be the bridge between the OGM and the um, future. A lot of the dialogue and chat has been about actually archive of the history, archive of yesterday. But uh, how do we develop the archives of tomorrow? Uh, and um, I do think that with your uh, mapping, Jerry, you are on the threshold. But there is another twist to it, which um, I learned when I was professor in Hong Kong, that the Chinese way of thinking is very different from uh, what all of us in this chat is thinking, um, unless you have trained to think uh, in Chinese dimensions. And that is that we see knowledge as an object. So the library is actually a collection of objects, but um, the internet is something much larger. It's an, a collection of uh, relationships. And these relationships might be extremely interesting to map out like Jerry is doing, but also to look for the sense making it in it or the wisdom in it. So how could we go to the wisdom dimension of OGM and the archives? I have not the solution yet, but um, I do think that you, you, you have started on, on a very interesting navigational journey. And together we can probably uh, learn to uh, cross the Atlantic in a very different dimension that we did many centuries ago. Yeah, thank you, Leif. Um, you're reminding me a little bit, um, my mind wandered a little bit over to last week, we talked about Buckley versus uh, Baldwin, the Oxford debate. And I went and listened to a little bit of it afterward. And, um, you know, Buckley's 15 minute argument uh, was that, hey, look, Baldwin is famous and is getting a lot of attention. He's, he's proof that, that you know, there's no discrimination or whatever. He, he doesn't say it that blankly, but, but he, what I'm trying to say is in that debate, Buckley's argument is the weakest beer. It's like, holy crap, what a crappy argument. And Baldwin is eloquent, poetic, and full of fire, just absolutely full of fire presenting things that are deep and, and like ought to be referenced really often as, hey, if you'd like a good argument for why racism is rampant in the US, just go look at this, right? J just, just go look at this and look at these arguments which you can connect up to other arguments and, and so forth. And, and for me, for me, the web, a well curated web of, of these kinds of things should be really compelling because it should connect back to root works that are worth reading. It should connect back, it should, it should concentrate and distill and focus the energy. It should collimate the energy of lots of people with similar sorts of opinions about really important subjects in a way that, that's accessible. It, it, should, it should let us kind of marinate in these important points of view 
in a way that helps us use them to change society. And we don't have that. Like we're not, we're not there. We're drowning in the info torrent. That, that to me, the reality of today is we are all drowning in the info torrent. And every year somebody invents something new. Oh, good. Now it's TikTok and Clubhouse, which doesn't really have a memory. Oops. Um, and, and we have more torrent to deal with and more things to check every day as we do the sweep of is somebody trying to message me on one of these damned media and less context and less wisdom, right? And this quest for wisdom is, is quixotic, but I think really important. Um, and Leif, I think you mean to uh, chat that to everybody because you just DM'd me weaving yeah. for wisdom, but you DM'd only me by mistake. Uh, let's go John and then Doug, and then we're getting close to our 90 minutes. Hey, so I'm going to start. Whoops. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great start, though. <laughs> I'm going to start with a, uh, a tweet from uh, Joshua Bach. Um, if you, he's probably in the brain. And if you don't know who he is, he's uh, worth following. He's, uh, he has what I would call a touch of earned arrogance <laughs> in that he's brilliant, you know, and you get a little bit of a tone of um, that. And, and now the, the tweet has gone off my page and I can't. Oh, no. But I'll t I mean, the gist of it is this. Uh, the, the problem with social media is that we have a symphony orchestra, a wrestling match and a kindergarten all trying to speak from the same stage at the same time. <laughs> And it was, a, you know, I was a lot, right away. I laughed as soon as I read it. I said, yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about here. That's kind of the problem. Now let's loop it back and, and bring in a couple of points, including the last point from Leaf about uh, Internet Archive and OGM in the future. Um, I'm just I'm still going to kind of do turbo versions of, of the Doug's idea of the columns. And I want to add in uh, Jerry's amplifications of it, you know, in terms of the richness of different points of view, the richness of media. And I want to acknowledge the work, but also the potential for subjectivity that comes when you say, OK, well, who's deciding, blah, blah, who's doing the map, who's doing the topic map of this thing? And will there ever be enough people who will want to do that? So I'm imagining a piece of software, actually, and it's not it may be artificially intelligent, but really it's not. It's more like this. There are a bunch of eligible gatekeepers to a matrix, like the kind of matrix we're talking about. And an issue comes up and anyone can step forward and say, as an eligible gatekeeper, I'm going to work on this, meaning, meaning I'm going to try to produce the link, the, 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 the valuable link that will fill in and go into the matrix. And there's different criteria for different kinds of links. I mean, it, the criteria for the story from last week, that's real easy, that's simple. You know, as it, as it gets more complex, the criteria are more complicated. So, you know, a couple of eligible folks, us, other people, you know, get together and say, you know, this, this might work as a topic map. It's gonna take some amount of time. It's gonna take an hour, a half day, maybe a day to figure out if it comes together. So we, we put up a little marker. We say, we're working on it. And what the software does is it says, are you done? Is it publishable? If it is, it gets, it gets ascended and put into the matrix. You know, you might work on it for a day and say, you know what? This doesn't work. <laughs> it's not, it does not quite making it, you know? And, and you know, there's, there's different kinds of criteria for coherence and usefulness, mm -hmm. but I can imagine a software augmented um, help in, in deciding that kind of thing. So then as you look across the matrix, you know, some things would be thinly uh, referenced. Here's the article from last week. Here's the long story from the New Yorker. Here's the thing from Reuters. Other things would be more thickly referenced. They would say, well, you know, there's a lot else going on here. Here's a topic map. Here's a, here's a game. Here's a thing you can do with it, you know, and it would, it would, it would, flesh out in, a, in an uneven fashion. And I think the unevenness is a, is a reflection of the real underlying complexity that might not be evident when you first look at the issue. So I'm still thinking about how that works as a, as a social system and whether or not it can be software augmented, even at the level of just having the software do the, do the consensus mechanism. 
And just one last thought is you could have that kind of, the consensus mechanism could be, I agree with this. I support this. I agree with this. <laughs> I, I don't agree with it, but I think it's adding to the discussion or I really think this is not helpful, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you, you might say that your criteria for getting it into the matrix is I got to have two or three people who say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a couple of other people who say it's helpful. And, and maybe no more than one person who says, I think, you know, this is actually hurtful, you know? I like that. And maybe as you post contributions into that medium, you earn NFT tokens. Yes. Instead of playing stupid Axie Infinity. Right. Absolutely. Um, cool. Uh, Doug, you look uh, like in profile there for a moment, you look very beautiful. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, the profile thing is an interesting issue. Uh, two things. First, for me, the problem with the Internet Archive that like so many uh, efforts is it's a lot easier to put stuff in than to know how to get it out. Uh, putting it in is kind of like dead storage. Getting it out is bringing it back to life. And boy, is that hard to figure out how to do. Uh, so that's just a, a, a meta comment. On uh, the proposal about the columns, uh, I don't want to turn it into something which gets measured in order to figure out what's in it. It's a, it's a human thing and it's a learning environment and it makes no pretense to being comprehensive. Two stories, for example, like the top story might be uh, what's up with China American tensions. Uh, underneath is the best article from yesterday that we can find. Underneath that is a good magazine article about it. Underneath that is a good book about it. Uh, it's a learning environment. It teaches people how to think contextually. It's not trying to be comprehensive. It's not trying to come up with uh, some kind of algorithm that fills in the space. Uh, it's human beings and it's just totally clear about that. It has a certain amount of humility. Uh, and my guess is that with time it would get better. Uh, Doug, thank you. Um, it's it's interesting. You're reminding me also that uh, I'm I like novels about cities, and I traveled for the first time to Istanbul pre-pandemic, and I was like, what can I read to tell me something about Istanbul? So I wound up reading the Janissary Tree, which is just fictional history about the Janissaries who got wiped out at one point because the Pasha in charge realized that they had too much power, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a whole sort of mystery mystery novel plot. Uh, set back in that era and it was really nice because i got i got there and i could look at some of the the guard gates or the monitor gates in the city and and, and think of them very differently and see them differently and, and so forth but wouldn't it be cool if some of the background that we could that we could access was more neutral and more about fiction and like hey here's you know here's here's somebody's take on that era and you can go inhabit that era for a while if you wanted to go back uh, back through this. And I guess the, the riffs on this are probably endless because this is kind of a, a holographic uh, entity as we start looking at it. Well, it raises an interesting question. If you're going to go to a country where you've never been, if you read a novel about that country, I would propose you know more about that country going there than if you read uh, news stories about it. Or Lonely Planet. Uh, uh, my April has a Lonely Planet addiction. She, we have a large stack of, <clears throat> stack of them and she loves to travel and she can actually dissect a Lonely Planet in seconds. It's like, it's like watching a sushi chef break down a fish. Uh, it's like the, the Lonely Planet arrives and it is underlined and marked up and where to go is, is set within minutes. It's, it's astonishing actually. Um, Mr. Carranza and then Michael and then Julian and then we, uh, oh, uh, so Mike, uh, Mark, you did want to talk. You just took your hand down, which is great. So uh, let's go, uh, Mark, Michael, Julian, and then let's wrap the call. Um, very quick in infrastructure comments. Um, basically, uh, the Zoom that the Internet Archive has is a, I guess, a corporate level high Zoom. It makes five different um, recordings. Recordings of uh, of the Zoom call. Um, and uh, is there a know, gallery view? Weekend, uh, yes. There's a gallery view. There's a um, uh, speaker view with presentation. 
Exactly. Speaker view. There's a different presentation view, which is black until a screen is shared. Um, and forget that one. Uh, basically, my question is, uh, you know, since, you know, it's, it's sort of a private meeting until you make your presentation. Uh, do we need to, you know, basically get an agreement before it goes out for editing that this part won't be shown? Um, um, we could also snip it. Um, at the, you know, everything before I start talking would be fine to, I'm, I'm interested really in sharing out uh, the, the part of the session where, where we talked about OGM and, and the, uh, the archive. Different way of saying what I just said. Yes. Okay. So um, uh, second thing is uh, there's a group, uh, SF Memex. Uh, we've been meeting over 10 years and um, uh, we have a meetup um, this Saturday. And I'm wondering whether it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to integrate with Zoom and invite people to talk. Um, nobody's volunteered to talk yet. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's herding cats and, you know, I'll get yeah. better at it uh, after uh, and, uh, the next one. But basically, um, uh, should I announce it in a small thing in OGM or just in the big, you know, town hall? Um, uh, your your choice, either the Google group or Town Hall Mattermost channel or the Calls Mattermost channel where we are right now, uh, or all three, if you feel like it, so you get the word out. That'd be great. Um, what time is oh, it? Thanks. Off to Michael. What time oh, is it's, it uh, it's two to five Pacific time. Um, two to five uh, on sa this Saturday. Uh, on Saturday, on this Saturday, um, uh, all are welcome. Uh, looking for people to present about, you know, what they do, um, you know, what do you do? Um, how do you do it? What have you learned? Is the three questions of the quantified self, which are pretty good for, you know, not having a sales, you know, presentation. You know, you should buy this because blah blah blah. What personally do you do? Um, off to Michael. Thanks. Sounds awesome. Thank you, Michael. Sounds very cool. Um, I, I was just going to say to John what you were saying about the um, the sort of, well, if a few people agree and you know no one objects and th that that kind of metric for um, for presentation or you know sort of, I would say filterability in a way because because what you're suggesting, I think assumes the existence of some kind of algorithm that notices that, and decides for you that this is visible and published um, because it doesn't have any objections and two people endorse it, as opposed to allowing each user to say, I want to see some raw stuff. I know that's what I'm doing and that's okay. And that's those are my search criteria. And I might find some stuff that I object to, but I want to cast a wide net and, you know surface a weak signal say that isn't somebody's consensus yet. And then other times you really want, there's, there's an information overload and you really want to see only things that 10 people have endorsed and you know, nobody has objected to, but to have those levers be in the, in the user's hands seems really like a cool thing um, and a tough thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Love that. Um, Julian. So I wanted to bring up that in listening to descriptions of systems where there is the ability for uh, filtering, for example, as Michael was saying, or curating, as other people have been talking about, but introducing a human element into the system, then the system leads rapidly to Facebook. Um, we need to separate the technology of the system from the human frailties of the system and try to build a technology which can make sure that those frailties don't overwhelm the system. And as a bad example, I would build up the, bring up the US constitution, which 230 years ago sounded like it was pretty solid, but in the last five years, we've seen just how frail and how easy it is to break that. So we've really got a couple of questions and I would say there's just as much, there's a huge challenge in determining how do you do your knowledge management and access but there's also just as much of a challenge in how do you make sure it's um, bombproof against people who want to break it. Bombproof is hard, as we're seeing. Bombproof is really hard. And there's this, this arms race between the breakers and the fixers. So go ahead, Michael. Sorry, I just want to respond to what Julian was saying, because I think he's absolutely right. And I just want to make clear that the, the Facebook problem, um, 
I think needs to be addressed in two ways. I mean, the Facebook problem is partly the, the lack of discernment. A, the, art, the algorithm is black box. You're not controlling the filters. The discernment over what likes are worth to you in different contexts is very important, you know, so that you can dial down the noise or dial up the noise, depending on, on what you're looking for. And that you're not seeing things you didn't ask for because it can't, I mean, an attention supported model is intrinsically, you know, show somebody something they're gonna click on. And that's not how I wanna get my information. And I would argue that kind of nobody should want that. And I don't think too many people actually do. They're not looking for sweets and candy in their diet. They're looking for tasty stuff and, and to have some intention and control over what they do. And if you didn't have an ad supported or attention supported model, I don't think it would work the same way. I mean, I'm not being Pollyanna, like it would all be solved if there weren't any ads, but you know, I think you can build for, you can build a user influenced information network that, that avoids a lot of the, the pitfalls that the existing ad supported free social media have. Mm -hmm. And Michael, I think the last half decade of social media have proven your points amply. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. This has been uh, really rich, really interesting, really appreciate it. Um, lots to think about. I just want to say out loud because I meant to say this like a quarter of the way in. Um, when Stacy joined, she tipped the gender balance ever so gently. Uh, and otherwise, it's all white guys in this room. We need to fix that. Uh, so please invite your friends who are not of our demographic. Uh, let, let's, let's do better. Um, but thank you all for being, but, but also I think our conversation was really valuable. I love the way we approach these different topics. So so thank you for that. As an informal representative of the Internet Archive, thank you for thinking about that. And um, boy, um, we're here to serve. Um, tell us what you need and uh, uh, be imaginative. Um, don't don't need to be gentle. Just you know, um, there, there's an opportunity that is rare. Hence the I motto think, of the uh, Archive: uh, to serve man. Um, the motto is it's um, a cookbook universal access to all um human knowledge that's better that's so much better than to serve man yeah. Sorry. um thanks everybody that episode is in the archive right so oh i'm sure yeah i hope so <clears throat> thanks everybody thank you have a Thank great you. Week. see you on the tubes